This is kind of um, an autobiographical sermon in terms of the fact that I myself am feeling um, the need, uh, the imperative to grow in the life of prayer. And so when I ran across these six verses in today's parasha of Moshe praying, I was attracted to them um, in order to uh, uh, explore them with you. So uh, we're looking at six verses in our Haftarah from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 25 to 29. We begin with Yeshua, our righteous Messiah, in Luke 11, verse 1, uh, the disciples are with Yeshua, and he is praying. And after he's done praying, one of the disciples says to him, Lord, teach us to pray like John or Yohanan taught his disciples. Now, why did they ask Yeshua uh, to teach them to pray? Two reasons. Number one, they they wanted his intimacy with the Father. They, they, no doubt, of course, they observed it, and they would they were hungry for it. They said, "Teach us to pray, so that we might have greater intimacy with God." And one of the things I want to emphasize tonight, probably the most important thing to emphasize, is that prayer is about developing intimacy with God. That's what it's, that's what it's really about. The second reason they asked him is that he was an example. He, they saw him, they witnessed him day for day by day. They saw that something was happening in his prayer life. So they wanted to imitate his, his example and they wanted the intimacy with the Father that Yeshua enjoyed. And I think we do too. We want greater intimacy with God, we should. Um, as I'll repeat in this drosh, uh, the Westminster Confession is absolutely right when it says that man's chief end is to know God and enjoy him forever. That's what we were created for. We were created to know God and to enjoy him forever. And uh, it says in John, it says, uh, uh, this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God, and Yeshua the Messiah, whom you have sent. This is what eternal life is all about, uh, growing in the knowledge of God. And prayer is the indispensable avenue for growing in knowing God. So we've learned these lessons, that prayer is about intimacy with God, that some people are exemplars, and we can learn from them. People in the in scripture, Avraham Avinu, Abraham our father, is an exemplar in prayer. The prophets are exemplars. Um, you can read the prophets are praying all the time, and you can learn from the, from their example. And of course, uh, Rav Shaul, the apostle Paul, was an exemplar. So prayer is about intimacy with God. Some people are exemplars, and we may learn from them how to pray more effectively. And again, this is my heartfelt emphasis. We want to pray in a manner that takes us deeper into life with God. When I was about 20 years old, maybe a little older, I saw a book which offended me, and it still does. The title was Prayer, Getting Things from God. I don't know what you think about prayer, but that's not what, that's not what prayer is about. Prayer is not essentially a heavenly Amazon. The, the meaning of prayer, the privilege of prayer, the purpose of prayer is to move deeper into our life with God. There is nothing more rewarding, there's nothing more important. And someday for every one of us, as we are facing our entrance into eternity, our life with God will be the only thing that matters to us. And it should be uh, at the top of our list now. So here again is this passage which, with which we finished uh, today's reading. And uh, I'll tell you what, I'll ask Pat to read these two slides. Read this, please, Patricia. 
So I fell down before Adonai for those 40 days and nights. And I lay there because Adonai had said he would destroy you. I prayed to Adonai. I said, Adonai, Elohim, don't destroy your people, your inheritance. You redeemed them through your greatness. You brought them out of Egypt with a strong hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Don't focus on the stubbornness of this people or on their wickedness or their sin. Otherwise, the land you brought us out of will say, it is because Adonai wasn't able to bring them into the land he promised them, and because he hated them, that he has brought them out to kill them in the desert. But in fact, they are your people, your inheritance, whom you brought out by your great power and your outstretched arm. Okay. So I have six ideas to share with you. The first is this. Let's remember the purpose and the pursuit and the preservation that is involved in prayer. We should pray like Moshe to deepen our relationship with the Holy One. The purpose of prayer is relationship, is to deepen our relationship with God. Uh, A.W. Tozer wrote a book. He was a great man of prayer, and he wrote a book called The Pursuit of God. That's what we should be engaged in in our lives. I don't want to be scolding and and I'm as guilty as anyone, but we get distracted by so many things that our life is about, but our life should really be about the pursuit of God. Um, it's our chief purpose. It's what we were created for. Um, the purpose of prayer is the pursuit of God, and uh, pursuing God preserves the quality of our relationship with him. I remember when I was about 20 years old, maybe 21, I was involved in New York City with a uh, uh, InterVarsity Fellowship monthly meeting or quarterly meeting or some kind of special meeting where they had a big shot coming to speak. The big shot was J.I. Packer, and I was part of a student panel interacting with Dr. Packer. What a privilege that was. I don't know why anybody did that with me. I was so wet behind the ears, I was drowning. But at any rate, Dr. Packer, I still remember what he spoke on, and I remember what he said, well, the key statement that he made at the beginning. His subject was praying in the Holy Spirit. And what he said was this, don't ask me to believe that a man who walks forward at a meeting and never prays is a Christian. That was his term. For us, we use the term believer. Again, don't ask me to believe that a man who walks forward at a meeting and never prays is a believer. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant that prayer is the evidence that we're spiritually alive. And if I would suggest, I would challenge us that if our prayer life is feeble and, uh, and marginal, then our spiritual life and our, our relationship with God is weak and is suffering. A, a vigorous spiritual life inevitably involves a vigorous prayer life. They go together, and relationship with God is related to our relationship to prayer. So this is the first thing to remember. Now, this is really from Moshe's example, but not a particular text in this, uh, this text. But I wanted to begin with this. We need to remember the purpose of prayer, the pursuit of God, and the preservation of our spiritual life is related to prayer. So now getting into the text, to pray like Moshe, we need to take time. He says, so I fell down before Adonai for those 40 days and nights, and I lay there. I'm not suggesting that we should pray for 40 days and nights. But this is a challenge to us. Uh, most of us, I, I'm being biographical now, I don't know how you guys pray. Uh, aside from our service, I don't know how you pray. But I pray, and most people I know I think pray this way, they hear about a request, 
and they shoot up a prayer about it. It's what my friend M. Hurley calls a tefillah shot. She says, the prayer, the, give a tefillah shot for me. Throw up a prayer. So we throw up a prayer, but it's a momentary thing. It's a, it's maybe, uh, usually it's just when we hear from the people what, what their request is, we shoot up a prayer. But is that the only kind of prayer that there should be? No, no. There should be a prayer that takes time. Prayer, why do we need to take time? Because we're not shopping. God is not a heavenly Amazon. We are in prayer. We are seeking to deepen our insight and our availability with to God. We're seeking to deepen our relationship. We're seeking to discover and to explore what it means to know God. So this will inevitably take time. I encourage you, by the way, and I'll encourage you at the end of this rush to this week, spend some time reading Exodus 32 to 34, 32 to 34. Moshe does a lot of praying there and you'll see he takes time. Why? Because he says to God, he says, you know, if you, uh, I pray they show me your glory. He says, I can't deal with these people. They're, they're such problematic people. Uh, if you don't go up with us, then don't send us up from here. And I pray, show me your glory. Moshe knows that the thing he needs most in life is an intimate relationship with God. So prayer takes time. And please, uh, it's easy for us for prayer to be to be crowded out of our life. We're so busy. We're so busy. Uh, prayer should be first priority. Second, uh, the, the the third point rather uh, is problem and plea. Adonai had said he would destroy you. I prayed to Adonai. I said, Adonai Elohim, don't destroy your people your inheritance, you redeemed them from your, with your greatness, you brought them out of Egypt with a strong hand. He knows what the problem is. He says, Adonai had said he would destroy you. He went to pray because of a problem. That happens almost always with us. We go to prayer because of a problem. Somebody is sick. Uh, uh, we, we, we need a job. Uh, we're, uh, somebody is estranged from us. They're, they're wandering spiritually. Whatever we pray for is almost always a problem. And then out of the problem grows the plea. Now, here's my challenge for you. And this has probably happened with you. Sometimes we go to prayer and we want to pray for somebody. And we start praying uh, routine, routine prayers about them. Uh, somebody's sick, say, oh God, please, you've made, you made John and uh, you made every molecule of his body, please heal him. And sometimes God will influence us during prayer where we adjust what we're praying for because God influences us. Um, in other words, when we go to prayer, we should let God and, and we should ask God and certainly allow God to influence us as to exactly what the real problem is. I had a friend in California, she's now living in Nirvana, she's a, now an Episcopal priest. And uh, she was a great woman of prayer in Pasadena, California. Uh, all of us respected her. And when she prayed for people, she'd say, God, what have you ripened Rusty for? In other words, what should, what should happen in Rusty's life now to move her forward? She sought from God a, an understanding of the problem. And then from that understanding the, of the real root of the problem of the situation, not what seems apparent, not what is superficially, superficially apparent, but with the help of the spirit, recognizing really what really needs to happen in Rusty's life at this time, from that understanding of the problem, that then grows the plea. So you see that prayer should be highly interactive. It should be a time of, of, of opening ourselves to sense the heart and mind of God. 
Uh, so the problem and the plea. Number four, past and promises. You redeemed them through your greatness. You brought them out of Egypt with a strong hand. Remember your servants, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Anybody we pray for, any situation we pray for, if we're praying for Ahavat and what the future of Ahavat will be, inevitably we should pray uh, um, with a, re a rehearsal and, a, re and a, a review of the congregation's past. We just don't pray forward. We look at the situation. We look at the past. How has God dealt with us in the past? What has our history been? What, how has God influenced us? How have we moved this way, that way, the other way? We need to realize that that situation we're praying for has a past. And we should pray in that context. I don't know how to make it clear. It's just something I feel strongly about. And I, I can't really articulate why it's crucial to do that, but it's far more human. And, and we're praying about, about something, uh, a situation where God has a history with that situation. People have a history with God in that situation. Even if their history in that situation is ignoring him, they have a history. You pray uh, with a review of the history, and then you pray on the basis of the promises. Remember your servants, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, to whom, with whom God made covenants. So we pray with a sensitivity to the past and not just the present. And we pray on the basis of God's promises. Now, five, directed focus. This is an extraordinary verse in our reading. Moshe has the nerve to say to God, don't focus on the stubbornness of this people or on their wickedness or on their sin. That was remarkable to me. I never saw that before. <laughs> don't focus. He's Moshe is telling him, God, don't focus on this. When we uh, when we pray, especially when we're we're really seeking to sense the heart of God, we might very well tell God, please, God, I know that this person has rebelled against you and is walking in ungodliness. But remember their history. Remember that they once loved you. Remember their mother who loved you and prayed for them all those years. Remember these things. Focus on that, please. And on the basis of that, please deal kindly with them. It's a very relational thing, a very human thing, a very holy thing for us to plead with God as to what to focus on about a situation. It's a way of asking for mercy. And, and, and God is pleased that we care enough about the situation that we're going to, in a sense, haggle with him a little bit. Avram, our father, he haggles with God. That marvelous story of his praying for Sodom and Gomorrah. He, you know, it's amazing. He says, if there's 50 right, is it, should the good judge of the whole earth do right? Shouldn't he do right? If there are 50 righteous people in the city, will you not, not destroy the city for the sake of 50? He says, okay, for 50. Then he gets down to 45, to 40, to 35, to 30, to 20, to 10. But he persists in, in seeking to reason with God. And when we tell God, please, God, focus on this and not on that, uh, it honors God. Here's the final point. Reputation and honor. Moshe says, otherwise, if you don't rescue your people, the land that you brought us out of will say, it's because Adonai was not able to bring them into the land that he promised them and because he hated them, that he has brought them out to kill them in the desert. He's saying to, to God, God, remember your reputation your reputation and your honor. If you don't help us, it will make you look bad. That's what he's saying. In the book of Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel hits this note over and over again. God says to the Jewish people, he says, you've, been, you've disgraced my name by being scattered among the nations and involved in all kinds of idolatry and sin. He says, I'm gonna bring you back to the land. I'm gonna restore your fortunes as at first. He says, but it's not for your sake I'm doing it. I'm doing it for the sake of my name. I'm doing it for the sake of my reputation. Because your fallenness, your wickedness, your sinfulness is, a, is, is 
brings dishonor to me. So God will always act to preserve his honor. He does. Uh, because if God appears to be worthless, nobody will seek him. So his honor is very important for the salvation of the world. It's important that God look good so that people would seek him. So we should speak to God in terms of his reputation and his honor. So today's focus was six observations from Moshe to deepen our life with God through deepening our life with prayer. I hope that something that I shared with you uh, whet your appetite to deepen your life of prayer in order to deepen your life with God. Why do you need this? You were created for relationship with God. It's, it's the reason we were made. You can't have a fulfilling life apart from growing in relationship with God. You might have a full life. You may have an enjoyable life, but you will have missed out on what really makes everything sing. Growing in relationship with God. Deeper prayer and deeper relationship go together. So what should you do? I think you should revisit this sermon on the web when it goes up uh, at our uh, at, uh, at our YouTube uh, page, and Rusty will give that in in the uh, the torch, the address of the YouTube page, so you can revisit this sermon, review it. I suggest you do read thirty two and thirty to thirty four of Exodus chapter thirty two to thirty four because it'll take you deeper into Moses' uh, life with God and his prayers. And I suggest you put one or more of these lessons into to work. I, uh, I don't feel the eloquence that I wish I felt for me to convince you to invest in advancing your prayer life. Um, not because it's a thing that good believers do, but because it's the avenue of growth in relationship with God, and that's what you were made for. Shabbat Shalom.